Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lapos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Glad to have you here at our Bible study tonight. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7 together. So I'm going to ask uh, Caroline to open up in prayer. Caroline? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord. Thank you for your word that we gather around, oh God. We're excited to hear what you are going to say through Pastor Alex. Holy Spirit, thank you for preparing our hearts to receive your word. Let us be more and more with every single Bible study, like the book of Acts, with more boldness, with more understanding, with readiness and preparedness of hearts. We praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight, Acts 6 and 7, the challenges faced by the early church and the same challenges that we have to face as well. So we begin at verse one. Now in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying, I'm having people coming in. So if, if I have to stop, it means I'm letting somebody in. When the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Now the Hellenists were Greek speaking Jews who were outside of Israel, who had come into Judea. And uh, let me tell you a little history uh, about these people. If you look at the map down here, you'll see that between the periods of 301 and 63 BC, there was a dispersion of the Jews all over the known world. And some of them went into Asia, some of them went into Turkey, Galatia, some of them went into Greece, and some of them went into Alexandria, Egypt. And the reason that they were dispersed is because there was a Greek general by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes who persecuted the Jews very heavily. And uh, the Jews that were in Jerusalem and in Israel at the time, some of them decided to leave the country rather than face the persecution that was taking place. So these Jews were scattered all over the empire. Now in 301 BC, the empire was Greek speaking. And then in 63 BC, it was Roman speaking or Latin speaking. But these um, Jews that were dispersed all over the place were primarily Greek speaking Jews. Now, during the book of Acts, when people were being saved, a lot of these Greek-speaking Jews had come back to Israel to live from these various countries that you see here on the arrows. And they came into the church, but they were different from the Purlain Jews who were Hebrew-speaking. So there was a problem between the two, because uh, for some reason, when the food was being distributed at their services, because in those days there was food at the, there was food always at a service in those days, uh, the Greek-speaking Jews, widows, were ignored, uh, were ignored, and they weren't getting any food. So that shows us that sometimes ethnicity could cause a problem. I know that today there are many ethnic churches that are doing very well. For example, Haitian churches or Chinese churches, Filipino churches, they all seem to do very well. But the churches that are not doing so well or that have uh, problems are churches where you have different ethnic groups together in one place. And I was never like that when I first got saved. In fact, one of the features of the church when I first got saved was that there were people from all over the world. And I know that in Bethel, that was the case too early on. But as time has gone on and the culture has become more diversified and people are sticking to their own kind more and more, we find that ethnic churches are the norm rather than the exception. And so when you get different ethnicities together under one place, even though they may be born-again Christians, there could be some tension because of uh, the situation of uh, racism. So what can we do? My first question is, what can we do to make people feel welcome as they enter into the body of Christ? Vivian, what do you think? What can we do to make people feel welcome the moment they walk in our door? Uh, show them, show, I mean, show love and accept them no matter how they are. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, Caroline, what do you think? What can we do to show people that they're accepted and loved? I think it's about the mindset that we have um, to, to, you know, to be blind to people's skin or not to care about where they're from, to remember that we're all sons and daughters of God. We're all created equal and uh, to show interest in them. Because when you show interest in somebody, when you're asking them questions about themselves, that's that's how you, you show people that they matter, that you care. Okay, and uh, Jeffrey, what do you think? When somebody comes in through the door, what should we be doing? A, a visitor in particular. 
Yeah, I'd just like to mention that before I came to Toronto, I attended a church that was ethnically diverse. Yes. By that, uh, our reason was diverse. It was 50% of West Indian heritage and 50% of, 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 of uh, people that were African heritage. Oh, and 50. so we, 50% West Indian, 50% African. So that I call that the ethnically diverse church. Okay, so anyway, yeah, well, you know, there, uh, sometimes people forget that Africans come from different countries. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, they could come from Ghana, they could come from Uganda, they could come from Nigeria. It's uh, Africa is not a country, Africa is a continent. And we need yeah. to remember that. What about you, Gerhard? You've, this is a topic that you've been very interested in. What would you say we need to do with new people? Um, get them involved early on. Um, introduce them in like social settings, not just church settings. Yeah, okay. That's good. And so they feel like they fit in. Yeah, well, we're going to be doing more social settings as uh, more social studies uh, settings as the year goes on this year in particular. So look for that. Uh, one of the things that uh, has impressed upon me is that people should be, we could, should connect it with them the moment they walk in. If they walk in before the service starts, right away somebody should be talking to them and ministering to them and finding out their name, their number, get their contact information right away, and then uh, immediately give them a response. I know that if I have their addresses or their phone numbers or their email, I contact them the next day. I don't wait a week or three days or or anything like that. I find that with new people, you have to contact them the day after they come. So I hope that all of us will have the attitude that when new people come in, we pay them a great deal of attention. We make them feel welcome, but we also find out who they are and how we can contact them so we can keep the connection going during the week. Now the 12 summoned <clears throat> the multitude of disciples and said it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So this, this problem of widows not being served was uh, a practical problem. It was not a spiritual problem. It was because there was just not enough people to serve the tables. There were Don't forget, when the church first started, there were 3,000 men saved alone. 3,000 men. If you add to that women and children, it could be anywhere from eight to 12,000 people right away. And so it would uh, present a very, very serious practical problem. And that means that they needed people, they needed workers to be able to serve this food to people. So the 12, the disciples who were in charge of the church, who were actually the pastors of the church in the beginning. They had the responsibility of finding good leadership. However, they themselves did not want to serve tables. As you can see in verse 2, they say it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Because obviously, if you're going to serve tables and deal with food, you wouldn't have the time to devote yourself to the word of God. You would have to spend the week preparing or maybe the day or two days before preparing food, organizing the servers and stuff like that. And so in verse three, they say, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who may we may appoint over this business, for we shall give ourselves continually to prayer and to ministry of the word of God. I find that scripture very interesting because this is about serving tables. This is about being waiters. And the qualifications for people serving tables, which meant that they would be deacons, because actually it was deacons who served tables. Uh, they had to be of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. These are very high qualifications. I mean, uh, they could have got anybody to serve tables, but no, that wasn't good enough for the apostles. The apostles wanted people who were of stellar Christian character, everyone that everyone knew were good, solid Christians and were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And so it wasn't just anybody that would serve tables and not anybody could be a deacon. But the disciples who were the pastors of the church at that time, the apostles, devoted themselves to the word of God and to prayer, which led me to think about the role of the pastor today. Now, the role of the pastor in those days was very different from the role of the pastor today, because in the early church, the apostles were given to the word of God and to prayer only. That's all they thought about, prayer and the word, prayer and the word, prayer and the word. And they were really deeply challenged because the only scriptures that they had were the scriptures from Genesis to Malachi. The New Testament had not been written yet. That would take place later on. But it kind of reminds me that today, in this day and age, a pastor's top priority should be prayer and the word of God. But here's the problem. 
the modern day pastor has so many responsibilities heaped on his head that a lot of times he doesn't have the quality time necessary to pray through and to come up with messages that can really transform the church. Because in order to do that, you need time. You need a lot of time, time in preparation, time in prayer, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to read to you an article about the modern day church and what it expects from their pastors that I got from the internet. This is not self-serving in any way. This is just for our information as to what this gentleman thinks about pastoring today. So let me just read it to you as, and we'll see what, where we go with it. We expect the leader to make tough decisions, to fire his close friend if necessary, or to send troops into harm's way, yet we want him to tear up a tear up over a sad story and be sentimental on Mother's Day. What we want is an illusion, and we know it. We prefer the illusion because we have a deep need to be buffered from reality, setting up our leader to be our big daddy, our bright and shining knight, our perfect mother who will get up in the middle of the night and hold us until we feel safe, makes leadership a nightmare, a nightmare that we inflict on a few while we comfort ourselves that we don't have the right stuff to pull it off. We merely are the followers who decide when to topple imperfect leaders. We can walk out of church and complain to our friends about another sermon that just wasn't up to our standards. We require our leaders to be perfect, or at least much more perfect than we are, and then we reserve the right to pick them apart or pick them clean like vultures that have patiently waited for the wounded beast to stop twitching. We expect our pastors to be perfect. We seem to think that pastors are cut from a totally different cloth than the rest of us, free from personality quirks, troubling habits, and bad moods. The truth is that pastors are human. They have unique personalities, strengths, and weaknesses, and susceptibility to sinful attitudes and actions, just like us. There is no perfect pastor, just as there is no perfect person. So what should we expect from our pastor? All right, let me ask you the question. Justin, what should we expect from a good pastor? Um, someone who cares for his sheep. Okay, that's one, yeah. What else? Someone who's devoted to the word. Okay, uh, Valerie, what would you expect to see in a good pastor? Uh, someone with wisdom who is able to lead his church to the right place, not to the place where it's, people think this is good, but where actually, because I think pastor have may have more wisdom, should have more wisdom actually than uh, the the people in the church. So just to lead us in a peaceful way to uh, the world. Okay, thank you. And Tom, what do you think? What makes a good pastor? Uh, one who doesn't love money. Okay, that's a good one, yeah. Brother Jeffrey, what do you think is a good pastor? It's a pastor that, that, that loves the Lord Jesus Christ and, um, and is confident in the word of God primarily, and he, and he loves his, his congregation. Okay, let me ask the question a different way. Mark, what do you think is the most important qualifications of a good pastor? Mark. Well, everybody's kind of touched on uh, some of the attributes that I think are important. Yeah. Uh, first of all, somebody, um, first of all, a pastor, uh, someone who's called Yo, to, that's a good to, uh, to a pastoral ministry. That's a good point. A pastoral, Very good. Excellent. With a pastoral gift. Yeah. I think that's very important. Yeah, that's extremely important. And finally, Kofi, what would you look for in a good pat a good pastor? How would you evaluate him for yourself? Um, you know, Paul lists out qualifications in First Timothy three. Yes, he does. Um, one to seven, and I think that. Uh, <laughs> You know, if I were to be looking at a, a, a pastor, uh, I'll be looking. I'll be looking for those qualities. Okay, so the qualities listed in First Timothy, and there's also qualifications in Titus on deacons. Okay, so we've got a pretty good idea of what you folks think a good pastor is. Let me share my ideas. What do we expect from a pastor? A good pastor preaches the word in spirit and in truth. A good pastor equips and encourages his flock to go out 
and reach the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. A good pastor values the gifts and talents of his church members and encourages them to use those gifts in leadership and service. A good pastor spends more time on his knees and in the word than on the golf course or at the gym or, <laughs> or at the lake. And what are some of the unrealistic expectations we have of our pastor? Well, he wrote that we expect our pastor always to be pleasant and engaging. Why is it that we who regularly express frustration, sadness, discouragement, and anger at things life throws our way expect that our pastor will always be in a good mood? We expect our pastor to meet every need in the church. We expect our pastor to never misspeak or deliver a less than stellar sermon. We expect our pastor to be the kind of guy that we would hang out with. But we need to realize he was not hired to be your fishing buddy. He was hired to lead you into a closer walk with the Savior and to teach you the precepts of God's word and to train you to share Christ with the world. And let's not forget that church is more than just the pastor. That's very important. Church can be a beautiful thing. Stay, grow, serve, love, engage, connect, practice grace and forgiveness. Encourage your pastor today. Pray for him. Tell him how much you appreciate him and try to maintain a realistic expectation for him as you learn and grow together in the body of Christ. Today's pastor is expected to be a skilled therapist, an outstanding marriage counselor, a brilliant administrator, a financial genius, available 24-7, a mind reader, a prolific communicator, an outstanding storyteller, physically presentable, with perfect of perfect wife and children, an astute disciplinarian, have it all together and be mistake free, always says and does the right things and makes you happy. And that is, Amen. and let me tell you, I've never, I've never met anybody, anyone, no pastor anywhere who has all of these gifts. I've had, I've met some guys that are good counselors. I've met some guys who are excellent in marriage. I've met some pastors who are tremendous administrators, but couldn't preach to save their lives. And I've met some guys who are really spiritually gifted, but are terrible administrators. I also know some outstanding storytellers, but these guys are not physically presentable. They're kind of overweight or sloppy or whatever. They, they don't have that uh, perfect, pristine look. And I've never met any pastor ever anywhere that has his family all together, that has that have kids that are perfectly behaved, that has teenagers that are perfectly behaved. In fact, pastor's kids, for the most part, become very rebellious when they get older. Now, here's another common view of today's pastor. This is a little bit different, but it's still a common view. And it's expressed by this gentleman here in the cartoon who says, I want to be a preacher like you because you only get to work once a week. <laughs> and you get to talk to God. This is the view that pastors don't do anything, that we have a cushy job. We have, we work one day a week on Sunday and the rest of the time we're not doing anything. And I can attest to you without any question that that is not true. So we've learned now the challenge of finding good leaders in the church. Now this evolved. Eventually this, the role of the pastor changed from somebody who devoted themselves to the word of God and prayer to somebody who fit the description in 1 Timothy chapter 3, because the church became bigger and more complicated, and there were churches all over the area, many churches, many local congregations who needed leaderships, and the 12 apostles just simply couldn't be everywhere at once. And so they appointed people with leadership characteristics, according to the word of God, who were able to do all the things that we've just read a good pastor does. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Now we're back in the book of Acts where they're trying to find deacons to be able to serve tables. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. I find this incredible because they probably prayed a long time to choose these men. These men probably did stand out about, above the crowd, et cetera. But the fact that they laid hands on them, like they, like Jesus would lay hands on his disciples. I mean, this is incredible. The, the, the uh, qualifications that were necessary just to serve food to people. So I thought to myself, what are the qualifications of a great leadership? And here are the qualities of deacons, not pastors, but deacons. Deacons are servants. They serve tables. That's the verb form of a deacon. In Greek, diakonos. They have a good reputation. They have a trusted character. They're full of the Holy Spirit. They have spiritual character. They're full of wisdom and they're competent for the function. They got to be able to do what they are assigned to do. I mean, they have to have some kind of gifts and talents. 
Kofi mentioned 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13. We're not going to look at that now, but uh, also likewise verses 1 to 7 of that same chapter. That'll give you a complete rundown of what a good leader is in the church. They also have to be reverent, respected for being respectable, and also not double-tongued, but honest, full of integrity, meaning what they say and saying what they mean. And once the leadership was set in place in the church, things began to move. I find that very interesting because our we as a church are in that position right now. We are establishing a leadership. We have finally filled all the positions on the board. We now have five board members. So I find that we're right in this space right here. The leadership is set. And when the leadership was set in the early church, things really started moving and started growing. We had these 3,000 people that had just gotten saved. We had a church structure and a church hierarchy now in place. And the spirit of God began to move, as you will see in the next verse. Here's what happened. Then the word of God spread. Why did it spread? Because the church structure was in place. And it was a church structure that was ordained of God. It was not ordained of man. God put this together. God chose the men that he wanted to be in leadership through prayer and through the laying on of hands. And what happened as a result? The number of disciples, in other words, the number of people saved, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, that's incredible. That's absolutely remarkable, because most of the priests in Jerusalem were Sadducees. And Sadducees had particular beliefs that were completely contrary to the Christian message. And here was the message that they preached. Here's a Sadducee right here. This is how they were dressed. And what they believed is expressed here in this little caption here. Only the, the only real Bible is the first five books of Moses and the rest is false. That's what they believed. Anything outside of the first five books of Moses, they considered false doctrine, false uh, heresy, whatever it was. So let's look at the details. The Sadducees rejected the oral laws was proposed by the Pharisees. Rather, they saw the written Torah as the only source of divine authority. So the only source that they had for guidance in, in life and in doctrine was the first five books of Moses. The written law in its depiction of the priesthood corroborated the power and enforced the priestly domination of Sadducees in Judean society. Now in Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, the third book of the Bible, it has a total description of what the priests are all about. The Sadducees use that to put themselves in power over the people. So instead of being servants of the people, they became lords over the people, and they pointed to the book of Leviticus to back up their domination of people in a religious sense. Now, according to the historian Josephus, the, Sad the Sadducees believe that there is no fate, no supernatural, no unseen beings of any kind that God does not commit evil. In other words, he doesn't intervene and he doesn't judge. That's what they believed when they say that God does not commit evil. They believe that man has a free will, that man has a free choice of good and evil, and that man is in control of his destiny and not God. They really believe that. So that's why when Jesus came and claimed to be God and demanded that people follow him, they were not happy with that. They did not believe that the soul was immortal. They believe that once you die, you're dead, and there are no rewards or penalties after death because there's no afterlife. I don't understand it, to be honest with you, but that's what they believed. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead because it's not mentioned in the first five books of Moses. They believed in the traditional Jewish concept of the grave, Sheol, for those who died. In other words, when you die, you rot and you say bye-bye. You never come back again. You, you're, you cease to exist and you're never again created to enjoy life. You're gone. Your life is over. So according to the Christian Acts of the Apostles, the book that we're reading now, we already found out that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, but the Pharisees did. And in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul often chose uh, to divide the Pharisees and the Sadducees so he could have some protection from the Pharisees, because Paul was a Pharisee himself, and he knew what they taught and believed. So he would adhere to the Pharisees in the area of resurrection and really upset the Sadducees. And in that way, he wasn't persecuted as heavily as he might have been. The Sadducees reject the notion of spirits and angels, whereas the Pharisees did believe in spirits and angels. And the Sadducees were said to favor the book of Sirach, the wisdom of Sirach. It's an apocryphic book. In other words, a book from the Apocrypha, not a book recognized in the Hebrew canon, in the official Old Testament. This was a book outside of that written by a man named Sirach, 
who kind of followed the pattern of uh, Solomon, the pattern of Proverbs, and put together all these wise sayings, wise sayings, and the Sadducees adhered to that. So basically, the Sadducees were godless philosophers, they were secular Jews, and they were power-hungry Mongols who paid the Romans huge amounts of money to attain supervision of the temple and the priesthood. And the fact that any of them got saved, any of them got saved is absolutely miraculous. So when the Bible tells us over here that a great many of the priests who were Sadducees were obedient to the faith because the priests in the time of the book of Acts were all Sadducees, it's absolutely miraculous. And it goes to show that anyone, anyone can be saved. Anyone can come to Christ, provided the Father initiate the process. So I find this astounding because the more I study about the Sadducees, the more I'm amazed that so many of them were saved in Jerusalem at the time of the apostles. Stephen was full of faith and power, and he did great signs and wonders amongst the people. Now, this is interesting because it's said today by some corners of the church that only the apostles worked signs and wonders. Well, we find out here that that's not true because Stephen was a deacon. He was not an apostle and he worked signs and wonders. And so did Philip, who was also a deacon. We're going to find about him in ch chapter eight of the book of Acts. And as a result of his being full of faith and power and working these great signs and wonders, he placed himself in the same controversial position as Peter and John, the apostles, who had just previously healed the man at the gate beautiful. The Sadducees did not like miracles. They were against miracles because they did not believe in the supernatural. And so when the blind were healed and the lame were healed and the deaf were given their hearing and the dumb were given speech, they really were upset. And they thought that this came from demons, which is incredible because Sadducees didn't believe in demons, but they had to blame somebody. So, <laughs> so they said it was demonic spirits. Incredible. Incredible what people will do when they're against something and they don't want to accept the truth, which is right in front of their face, they'll come up with any explanation. Now, what happened was, is that they disputed with Stephen, as you can see here, and those of the synagogue of the freedmen, Syrians and Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, who were leaders of the synagogues, rabbis, got into a big argument with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Why? because he was empowered by the Spirit of God, and he was given an answer to be able to answer the challenges and the charges that were placed against him. He was prepared. And my question today is, how can we be prepared to meet the challenges that will be thrown at us? Justin, how can we be prepared to face the challenges? In what sense? Uh... Because well, there's different angles I can answer the question, though. Well, but answer, answer it from any angle you wish, because we're going to get more detail later. So, uh, what can we do to be prepared to answer the challenges of unbelievers? So, studying the word is is obviously one of them. The more that we know the word, um, the better uh, we uh, the the closer we get to Him. It, it, right. it ties in with the five pillars of the of the Christian faith. So, those right. are. I would say all five of them are important things that could be tied in. Right. Okay, and what about you, Mark? What do we need to do to prepare to be able to meet the challenges that we're going to face in the secular world? Uh, turn on your microphone. Yeah, outside of what Justin was saying i mean there's not there's not really that much more because we we have the uh the new time you know the new testament is all is yeah. all inclusive to be okay. able to handle those uh, objections all right anybody want to add to that knowing the word of god that's one way to prepare yes caroline what about you what would you say how do we prepare to meet the challenges being filled with the spirit because the spirit will give us the answers the spirit will show us what needs to be done Right. Spirit will show us, he'll also give us discernment and show us the heart of the person that we're dealing with. That's true. And Joseph, what do we need to do to be filled with the Spirit? Jo Joseph. I don't think Joseph is with me. Hello, Joseph. Uh, 
Okay, Jeffrey, what do we need to do to be filled with the Spirit? Um, to me, it's to meditate upon the Word of the Lord. And meditate the on the Word of the Lord. Yeah. What about you, Oliver? How can, how can we be filled with the Spirit? Proclaim Jesus Christ. Proclaim Jesus Christ. Okay, Sister Bev, what do we need to do to be filled with the Spirit? Got to prepare ourselves. We got to know the Bible. We got to be able to convey whatever we have learned into. If we are going to try to bring people to to um, to this word again, so we have to really un understand the Bible and know what we're saying. Really understand it and know it. Okay. What about you, Vivian? What do we need to do to be filled with the Spirit? Um, through, pre through prayer, and we yeah. invite the Holy Spirit to fill us. Yeah, yeah, through prayer. Exactly. Thank you. I was wondering when somebody would say that. Okay, so we need to pray and be filled with the Word of God and know what we're talking about. Having said that, let us see what they said about Stephen. Then they were sec secretly induced men to say, we have heard him, that is Stephen, speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses has delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him and saw his face as the face of an angel. Now, those were the lies that they told about Stephen. He never did say that Jesus would destroy the law. Not at all. In fact, later on in his defense, we find out that he knew everything there was to know about the law and about the history of the Jews. But they challenged him. They, they come up with some kind of challenge that they felt would be effective in having him condemned. Now, what are some of the lies told by our society about Christians and about Jesus? What are some of the lies people say about us? Uh, Tom. Uh, we're self-righteous. Self-righteous, okay. Justin, what's another lie that people say about us? Uh, that God is an imaginary friend. Oh, yes, that's right, from Sunday. Yes, very good. Vivian, what does the society say about us, challenges us? Vivian, what are the lies they say about us? Um... Sorry, I'm not too sure. Okay, Caroline, what are some of the lies people say about us? Um, sorry, I was having a problem with my phone. Uh, what are some of the lies they say about us? Well, they, they call us uh, bigots. They say that we're divisive. Okay, divisive. And Michael, what are some of the lies that people say about Christians? Michael. I hope he's near his microphone. Uh, Pastor? Yes. I'm sorry about earlier because uh, uh, my microphone wasn't turning on. Okay, I, I got it running. Okay, Can so I, what, what are some of the lies that people say about Christians, Joseph? That we're just a bunch of fanatics and uh, and part also of, um, uh, you know, they... They know in the world there's a lot of, of cults, but they don't know what a cult is. Okay. However, they classify us as a part of that great big uh, cult. Oh, we're part we're cult, a part of a cult. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And finally, Valerie, what do what are some of the lies people say about us? Valerie's heard a couple of them. <laughs> that uh, we believe in a medieval uh, fairy tale. Oh, we believe in a medieval fairy tale. That's a good one. Okay. Let me show you some of the things that I listed. Here's what people say about us that are common in a secular society. We are called bigots. We are called conspiracy nuts. We are called gullible and dumb. We are called hateful, intolerant hypocrites. We are called liars. We're called greedy. We're called haters, mentally deficient and irrational. And of course, we believe in medieval fairy tales. I should have added that. But here are some cartoons and some illustrations of what people believe in us. 
in particular Pentecostals. This is what people believe in us, but believe we are. A bunch of real, total, mindless idiots jumping around and screaming and praising. And our pastors are all money hungry, money hungry people who just steal our money and fill the offering plate with coin and shove it right back in their pockets. That's one way, or that's one of the things that people believe. Now let's look at what they believe about Baptists. This is a picture of the Westboro Baptist Church. And these people have done more to disparage Christians than anybody else I know. So Christians sometimes are responsible for the things that people believe in them. These people will go out in the streets with these kind of signs. Look at this. God hates Jews. Rabbis rape kids. Mourn for your sins. Fags are, pe are beasts. You're going to hell. Israel is doomed. God hates you. No peace for the wicked. America is doomed. And of course, with the flag of Israel there. That's not going to gain too many friends, and that's not going to bring anybody to the Lord. Then we have this image here that people have. I'm a Bible thumper and proud of it. And then we have something that Mahatma Gandhi said, the great leader of India, who said, I don't reject your Christ. I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. That's very interesting. And then finally, we have here a hypocrite who pretends she's something that she's not. And there's her mask her Christian mask down here, and here's what she's really like underneath. So sometimes we can be our worst enemies, and we can be the cause of the of the of some of the objections that people have towards us. Now we move on to Acts chapter 7. We need to remember that Stephen was accused of something specific, and you too will be accused with something specific, and as, as well as praying and knowing the Word of God, which is very important, you've got to be able to answer the charges. So when somebody calls you a bigot, You've got to be able to defend the faith and show that we're not bigots, that we're not conspiracy nuts, that we're not gullible, that we're not hateful, intolerant hypocrites. We're not liars and greedy and haters. We're not mentally deficient and we're not irrational. And in order for you to do that, you have to do your homework. You have to understand where people are coming from, why they say these things, and be able to give an answer and a defense for the hope that we have in us. Stephen was accused of being anti Jewish. And his response, was to prove his proficiency in the Jewish heritage because the high priest had asked him in verse seven, or verse one rather of chapter seven, are these things so? Did he really discuss destroying the temple? Did he really say that Jesus had come to end the law? So G uh, Stephen was accused of being unfaithful to the law. And so he shows that he knows what he's talking about. Now that's interesting because it's a challenge to me because too many of us Christians, we don't know what, why we believe. We don't know what we believe. And we certainly do not know how to defend it in the face of the softest opposition. And that's important that we are able to do that. We need to train ourselves to be able to answer the charges that are levied against us. Now, we're not required to convince anyone. That's God's job. But we are required to be able to explain, defend, and present the gospel in a clear, accurate, gentle, loving, and powerful manner. And sometimes we, we just don't even know what the gospel is. So what do we need to do to accomplish this? Well, we need to answer these following questions that I said on Sunday. Who is your God? What has he done for you? How do you know he's real? What distinguishes him from other religions? Hasn't science proven that the Bible is a book of myths? So let me try them out on you. Tom, who is your God? Don't worry if you he's can't my, answer. Don't worry if you can't. He's my, sorry? I said, I'm just talking to everybody. Don't worry if you can't come up with an answer right away. This is just for training purposes. So, Tom, who is your yeah. God? He is my uh, my creator, my father, and my savior. Okay. Caroline, what has he done for you? He's healed me. Yes. He's guided me to make good decisions. And... And he's provided for me and helped me to pay off my debts miraculously. Okay. Joseph, how do you know your God is real? That's for Joseph. Uh, one thing uh, I can attest of is that I wouldn't even be here talking to you if not for God. I know that. And that's why I know that he saves. He saves and... and um, delivers you from um, any uh, um, any kind of a situation uh, which I would have not 
um, been be a, uh, been able to uh, uh, what I call us. Um, I probably would would have been uh, somewhere else. Yes, exactly. Well, we know that for sure because you had a heart attack that you survived, and that was God's mm -hmm. doing all the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, Oliver, what distinguishes Jesus from other religions? Jesus is the way, the only way to heaven. There's no yes. other way but through him. And he's yes, the only Lord. one who could who died for us, who sacrificed himself for us. Yes. He's the only one who, who can be closer to us than any brother or friend. He's our all in all. He's our everything. And the other religions don't teach that? No. They, oh, don't, don't. they, they don't teach you anything. They, they, they say you have to earn any, you have to earn your... Uh, you have to earn friendship. You have to earn your salvation. You have to earn. Uh, it's always conditional. And um, and with Jesus, it's different. Yes, of course, because Jesus, uh, Jesus is our. He's our, our for everything. He gives us life. He gives us. He's not only our our enabler, but he's our provider. He's uh, he gives us, and he's he he, he gives us um, the results of what we. Not the results, but the the uh, account. The um, is the reason that we're alive. Okay, and the last one I'm going to give to Kofi, which is a difficult one. You don't have to answer it in detail, Kofi. But hasn't science proven the Bible is a book of myths? What would you say to that, Kofi? Um, I think that for me, the Bible gives clarity on the human condition. So. If, if it's a book of myths um, and we compare what the Bible says about our lives, uh, humanity, the way we think, the way we, we behave, uh, you can see that, you know, uh, removing, just removing the spiritual aspect yes. and just looking, you know, uh, uh, comp <laughs> comparing what the Bible says about us to how we actually are. Um, it's one for one. It's it's bang on. So uh, okay. it cannot be a, a, a book of myths. Okay, so I'm going to do a whole Bible study on this one Sunday or one Tuesday on uh, showing you how science has not proven that the Bible is a book of myths because science is not equipped to prove that kind of thing. But that's for another Bible study. Let's take a look at what Stephen was charged with. The official charge against Stephen was entirely based on his so-called disrespect of Judaism. But he shows in his answer that he knew Judaism better than they did by exposing their true state. Now, I don't know if I have time to read all of this because it's already 819, but I'll read some of it. And Stephen said, brethren and fathers, listen, the glory of God appeared to our father Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And he said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to a land in which you now dwell. God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give him a child for his possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. Mm -hmm. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. He gave them the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence mm -hmm. of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was no that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers there first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. And so Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they carried him back to Shechem and laid him in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. And when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. 
This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. When he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses learned all the wisdom of the Egyptians as was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver him by his hand, but they did not understand. The next day he appeared to two of, two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, men, you are brethren, why do you wrong each other? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. Then Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who has made you a ruler and a judge is the one that God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise for you a prophet like me from your brethren and him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. But in, his, but in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. And as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifices to the idol and rejoiced in the work of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as was written in the book of the prophets. Uh, did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Rephim, images what you made to worship, and I will carry you away towards Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed... Uh, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, and what place is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the fathers did your, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Now, this is remarkable because everything that Stephen said was contained in the first five books of Moses. So he nailed the Sadducees right, right where they live. Then here, right here, he moves from the five books of Moses to David and to Solomon, which means he went beyond the books of Moses into now the Old Testament. And he talks about the building of the temple, which existed in that time. And he places the Sadducees in a very difficult position to understand what was the origin of the temple. Because the temple was standing at that time. Now, here's the thing. Here's where he really nails the Jewish people and really brings it to the core. This is the key aspect, that even though these people adhere to the law of Moses and some of the Pharisees to the prophets and the Psalms and wisdom. They were stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart, and always resisting the Holy Spirit. Now, you'll notice that he never mentions the name of Jesus, never says the word Jesus, until this part right here. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed their teeth against him. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, look, I see the, hand, the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. 
Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ratted him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, the Apostle Paul. And they stoned Stephen, Stephen as he was calling out on God, saying, Lord Jesus, this is the first time he mentions Jesus by name, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he has said this, he fell asleep. Not one mention of Jesus by name. Not one mention of the destruction of the temple. In fact, he establishes the building of the temple. Not one mention of any of the charges brought against him. But he confronts the Jews for their repeated historic rebellion against God and his prophets. And he implied that they were doing exactly the same thing to himself and to Jesus and his disciples. So what can we learn from Acts 6 and 7? Here's what we can learn. Number one, that the church will have imperfections that we will have to pray through. We saw that with the conflict between the Hellenists and the, and, the, and the Pure Land Jews. Number two, every believer has a part to play, if for nothing else, to allow the pastor and the leadership of the church to focus on the word of God, prayer, and making disciples. Number three, we learned of the qualifications of great leadership, very important for putting together a church and structuring a vision. Number four, we examine some of the attitudes unbelievers have towards us and realize that we have to be prepared in the word of God and prayer and also understand what the charges are specifically so that we can answer them. Number five, we have to be ready in mind, body, soul, and spirit to deal effectively with opposition, all the while remaining in a spirit of goodwill and love like Stephen did. Although he was being stoned, he still prayed for his accusers. In short, to be the true body of Christ, we must be prepared for the total investment of ourselves in the things of God and actively cultivate our relationship with him and with each other so we can grow in the things of God. And that, my friends, is the Bible study for this week. Thank you for listening, and I'm going to ask Kofi to close in prayer. Kofi. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you, and we thank you once again. Father, we... Ask, O oh God, for your hand. It is impossible to have these attributes. It's impossible to um, exemplify um, the attributes that we have learned tonight without the Spirit of God working in us. Right. I pray, Father, that you will touch our hearts, touch our lives. Mm. Give us strength. Give us the courage. Give us compassion, Lord. Teach us to be like Stephen, where even while facing death, oh God, um, allows the spirit of God to lead him. I, I do not believe that he uh, planned that sermon or wrote it out in his, uh, you know, in, in, in his scrolls and studied it uh, in preparation for this day, but the, the spirit of God let him and, and so i pray father that you give us that ability to be led by the spirit that whatever persecution whatever situation we face oh god that will allow the spirit to work through us and speak through us and minister to us in the mighty name of jesus i pray father that you will also remind us of our testimony what it is that you have done for us and who it is that you are to us oh god such that when we are faced with questions, we can answer. And Lord, I also pray, Father, that you, you, you prevent us from getting into frivolous arguments and discussions. They're, they're just so, there's just so much noise out there um, with all kinds of um, fallacies being thrown around and, 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 and your children getting into all kinds of arguments. Uh, and discussions with God that don't bring any value. So I pray in the, in the name of Jesus that you lead us into conversations, oh God, that will actually yield fruit, where our hearts, where the Spirit of God could actually uh, uh, be demonstrated and shown, where the fruit of the Spirit can be demonstrated, oh God. Lead us into conversations, lead us into situations, lead us to people who are truly seeking Oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus, and use us in ways uh, that you have purposed us uh, uh, to be used, oh God. I pray, Father, that the giftings and the callings and uh, the spiritual uh, gifts and the fruits and 
and and and and and and and the um, the ministries that you have given to us, O oh Lord, will be uh, will rise to the surface, O oh Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. The things that you've planted in our hearts uh, will 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 begin to be made manifest, and our tools and and our attributes, Father, that you have given us, Lord, will uh, uh, will come, you know, to, will will be birthed in us, O Lord. Will, will, will become evident in our lives, Father, that we'll, we'll use these things, oh God, to uh, expand the kingdom of God. We thank you for our pastor, as always, preparing uh, such a, a detailed and, uh, and accurate uh, 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 Bible study, oh God, and, and sharpening us and bringing us uh, closer to you and closer to the purpose that you have called us to. So bless him. And bless his family, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, um, even as we have learned today, Lord, that you will teach us to encourage him, teach us to support him. Uh, you will teach us to strengthen him, oh God, not um, expect uh, 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 irrational things from him, uh, um, but to understand that um, he is your son, he is your servant, he is your representative, but he is also a man. Uh, and so we, we pray, oh God, that you strengthen him even as you strengthen us. Care for him even as you care for us, oh Lord. Speak to him, encourage him, uh, 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 and encourage us, oh Lord. And let us encourage each other uh, from one to another in the body of Christ. We bless you, oh Lord. This is a special assembly, Father, and I thank you uh, for the house, Bethel, oh God. And I pray, Father, that you continue to bring us from grace to grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Caroline, would you pray for Valerie? She's got a flooded house. She's got all kinds of problems with the car. Let's just pray and lift that up to God, Caroline. Yes. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are the God with all the answers. You knew what was going to happen, Lord, the flooding and all the other things that ensued with that. And Father, we thank you that we can come to you you who is our Jehovah Jireh. And I pray, Lord, that you would provide for Valerie. Lord, the workers that are going to do an excellent job, Lord God, that you would give them wisdom, Lord God. And uh, wherever they are lacking, that you, would, that you would meet the rest of the way and give them everything that they need to know how to do so that they will do things well. Let them have a desire in their heart to work with excellence, because this is the dwelling place of your daughter. And you are a God and a king of excellence and of order. So I pray, Lord, that there would be not one thing forgotten in all the steps that they need to follow to set her house in order, to make sure that no mildew, no mold will settle in with all the water. Lord, I would pray that all the water would be dried up. Lord, every single drop would be dried up in Jesus' name and quickly. And we thank you, Father, that all the different parties that are involved, whether it's the insurance, whether it's the, um, I don't know, plumber, electrician, whoever is involved, you know, Lord, that they would all communicate well with each other and, and do things in the proper order, and that she will have a house in better state than it ever was. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Father, also for giving her patience during this time, Lord God. It, it can be very taxing on our emotion and very draining. I just pray, Lord, that you fill her heart um, with gratitude and with patience. And where we fail as humans, Lord, I, we know that we can come to you and you can give us what we need. Because it's not easy to go through something like this, Lord God. In fact, it's downright hard, especially when we have a full-time job to boot and all of this in the middle of winter. But I thank you. You are her helper, Lord. And you will strengthen her in this season, Lord God. And she'll be happy that she'll have a, a house that is better than she's ever had before. So we give you all the praise, all the glory. And Lord, if there's any worker that needs to hear your gospel, I pray, Father, that you would use Valerie. Let them see kindness and love in her. Let them be drawn to that and, and that you would give her the words. Lord, if there's anyone who um, that, that you are drawing who's, who's white for the harvest, Lord God, use Valerie and her words to bring them into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we go, I just want to emphasize something Kofi shared, that the attributes of the, the early church are impossible for us to achieve. But in God, all things are possible. So if anything, we're learning from the book of Acts 
we learn that we need to seek the Lord with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and he will implant the attributes in us that are necessary to be an effective church. And with that, good night. See you soon. Amen. God bless y'all. God bless you. Everybody.